Hi, this is uh, Avesh Rashid. I am Professor of Cybersecurity at the University of Bristol. And today I'm going to be talking about the human factors knowledge area within the Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge project. This is a knowledge area that uh, Angela Sasa uh, at uh, the University of Bochum and um, University College London uh, um, uh, and I have jointly, jointly authored. Um, uh, during the course of the webinar, I will be talking about some of the key points uh, and uh, the um, knowledge area documentation that is that is available on the Cyborg website provides a lot more detail uh, that underpins uh, some of the key concepts that I, I will be discussing. Uh, we will we will start with um, uh, talking about the uh, importance of human factors in cybersecurity, uh, particularly uh, uh, talking about designing security that is usable and acceptable to a range of uh, human actors. And that just does not mean end users, but it also means administrators, developers, and, and so on. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, very first example, uh, which is that uh, which is that of a system that we all use on a regular basis in, in our daily lives nowadays, and that is email. Uh, today, uh, approximately less than 0.1% of email that we send is end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, and uh, that is a, an, an interesting interesting problem uh, because almost 20 years ago, uh, Alma Witten and David Tiger wrote, wrote wrote an article which was called "Why Johnny Can't Encrypt," and this was a usability evaluation of the PGP encryption system um, uh, and why users struggled to to encrypt. encrypt Encrypt their, encrypt their email. We are 20 years uh, down the line from um, Witten and Tigard's original original paper, and yet still we do not seem to have cracked the the problem of just sending sending encrypted email. And there are a number of things that underpin pin these the, uh, the, the, the this lack of take up of encryption in, in, in terms of email. And primarily one of the big reasons is, is, is usability because users find the encryption tools very, very hard to use. And if you, for example, uh, use encryption tools uh, and more recent PGP implementations that go into email programs, uh, you can notice that there are lots of things that are uh, complicated to do. Uh, and as a user, it interferes with the primary task that you are trying to achieve, which is effectively a message to achieve a piece of work or or to communicate with with a with a friend or or um, uh, or relative before we dive too too far into the human factors knowledge area one of the key things that we we should talk about is that there is a, a, a term that is often used in the um uh, in in the wider uh, uh wider discussion which is often labeling uh, humans as as the weakest link in in security and of course you know mistakes and errors are possible and we are all uh, after all uh, prone to making making mistakes or doing things that we didn't intend to do but this uh, notion of humans being the weakest link tends to shift the blame towards the user but many a times it's nothing to do with the user intentionally or even unintentionally behaving insecurely. It is the design of systems that actually um, uh, lead to lead to those kind of behaviors. So as an example, let's go back to the example of email. Uh, uh, links in emails, web links are there to be clicked because that makes it easier for users to get on to the online information sources that 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 the uh, email is directing them towards attachments are there for people to be able to open them and 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 use them and so on so when for example someone clicks on a on an embedded link that that is effectively a phishing attack or something like that it is not really reasonable to to blame blame the user we have to provide more usable ways of doing security that do not push the burden or a large burden on onto the user if if uh, someone is receiving uh, um, close to 100 or 200 emails uh, a day which they are trying to respond to in the uh, alongside other tasks that they are undertaking it is not really a reasonable assumption that they will scrutinize every email in detail for signs of phishing and being aware that there is potential um, malicious payload in, in 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 the emails that they are receiving and again this is this is a work that um, has been uh, th this work has been highlighted for a long time, almost kind of same time as with an entire um, 
uh, paper on um, uh, uh, encryption. Uh, Anne Adams and Angela Sasa wrote the well-known paper, Users Are Not the Enemy, uh, <clears throat> where uh, they discuss the problems of why users do not follow the password uh, policies that organizations uh, uh, set for them. And uh, there are several findings from, from that work and subsequent work which, which goes on to highlight that, for example, password policies which require you to create very complex passwords and then remember them uh, are, are, uh, are, are not very usable for the users. And uh, things like writing down and the act of writing down uh, a password is not something that the user necessarily wants to engage in. It's because they find it hard to remember the password in the first instance. And then there are other challenges in this regard. So for example, many password policies over the years have asked users to change their passwords every three months. So you've memorized the password, now you have to go and, and, and change your password and rememorize it. And that takes a significant effort to try and uh, embed it in your memory and then recall it at the time where you want to do. Uh, at the same time, given the number of online systems that we use, many of them with their own uh, um, access uh, credentials and passwords, it makes it very complicated to remember uh, a wide range of passwords. And of course, there are newer mechanisms such as um, uh, 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 password managers, and um, uh, th those kind of uh, uh, tools which actually make it possible for uh, the user to more effectively manage um, uh, their their passwords and and utilize the services that they they want to want to utilize however one of the key things that we we, we should uh, notice that the more something uh, pushes the burden of doing uh, security towards the user, uh, it basically attempts to fit the human to the task. So we are uh, effectively saying, saying to a user that they have their primary task, for example, whatever they are doing in their office or in daily work or in their home life, and now they have to fit the additional task of security into that, into that primary task, which often takes it away from, from the, uh, takes, takes their attention away and their focus away from the task that they are trying to accomplish, be it sending invoices or, for example, uh, you know, uh, preparing uh, particular uh, course materials in, in the case of a university or, for example, developing software or, or, or various examples that you can think of. So the key to human factors is that instead of uh, fitting the uh, human to the task as often the design of security controls is is prone to do. Uh, we we actually need to fit the task to the human. We have to ask the question as to how uh, security may fit in more seamlessly or perhaps less intrusively into the daily tasks that that people do in in their work or their personal life, and reduce the burden of 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 doing security onto onto the users. This uh, leads us to uh, a number of key things that we have to consider with regards to security being usable. Uh, the security has to be effective. So effectiveness is a key, key requirement. Can users achieve their goals? And let's, let's remember, the user's goal is not, for example, to log into the system. The user is logging into the system because they want to accomplish some task be it, for example, as I said earlier, um, uh, uh, input some data, send invoices, or in the case of online interaction, for example, doing some online shopping or engaging in social media communications. The second is efficiency. What resources are expended to do so? Do they have to do a lot of work to uh, achieve the task that they, they wanted to achieve in the first instance? And then finally, satisfaction. What is the level of comfort and acceptability? for uh, users. So uh, again, there are studies that show that, for example, typing complex passwords on uh, pop-up keyboards on small mobile devices uh, is, 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 is hard to do. In case of some of the Internet of Things devices, uh, there is a need to log in through a, a web server uh, remotely and then go through various, uh, various types of settings. And that all leads to quite a range of uh, discomfort and lack of acceptability in terms of investing time and, and resource uh, on, on part, part of the user. So the knowledge area uh, uh, within, within Cyborg that we are discussing today, uh, human factors, deals with a number of these, uh, these, these questions. Uh, 
the knowledge area is uh, uh, organized as is shown in this figure. That is on the slide. Uh, it starts on the inside uh, working uh, working outward. So we, we, we start with the individual and internal factors that drive human behavior. So capabilities and limitations. So for example, human memory has its, uh, its limitations, but also uh, you know how people make decisions, what their mental models of security might be. So for instance, uh, um, uh, as, as technologists, people who, who design systems may have a very different understanding of how those systems operate than a user who often sees these systems as black boxes and uh, is seeing them as a way of achieving achieving a task. Uh, so once we um, consider uh, these uh, internal factors that drive human behavior, we move on to aspects of the broader con context in which uh, interaction with security takes uh, takes takes place. Um, and and in 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 that regard. Uh, we, we can consider a number of uh, factors that have an impact on our own behavior as users. So, for example, the behavior of others around us and especially how they handle security risks. So the uh, concept of security cultures in organizations is often sort of mentioned and there are parallels with health and safety cultures that are now much more well established. And the key here is that if uh, people around us constantly act in an insecure way and there is just an insecure culture in the way an organization operates, then it's fairly um, uh, reasonable to assume that a new uh, uh, employees in an organization will uh, think that that is the norm and continue to engage engage in, 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 the, in the same way. But also user his emotional stances towards the organization how security behavior can be managed through the design, uh, 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 throughout the design, and and the 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 group and organizational factors that that impact uh, these um, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, our attitudes to uh, attitudes to security. We can also see in the in the figure for 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 uh, instance that uh, uh, the adversary has to be considered in in the in this whole picture. So human uh, uh, humans is um, interactions with with uh, systems and and security do not happen in a in a um, in a uh, closed setting. Uh, adversaries, for example, uh, cyber criminals or attackers who who may wish to uh, compromise the security uh, of 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 a system, uh, uh, will will use various mechanisms to, for example, uh, alter people's perceptions of what the system is doing or what, may, what it may be doing as they are trying to uh, carry out their tasks and achieve their goals. And they may exploit the uh, social context. So for example, how uh, organizations operate or how our interactions with colleagues uh, work. So for example, uh, uh, in terms of physical access, uh, into an organization tailgating when someone else with authority has passed through a door, or for instance, uh, the, the various social engineering attacks that, that uh, are, are more recently seen where uh, adversaries uh, create uh, email addresses on more public uh, email services uh, with, the, with the name of someone who holds a position of authority, for example, the head of a department or a director, and then send messages from, from that email address uh, claiming that it is coming from the uh, uh, actual person and asking people to engage in tasks often uh, that requires them transferring amounts of money uh, into, into different, different accounts. Uh, so we, we should always consider that human interaction does not actually uh, happen in isolation, and there is often an active adversary that is trying to interfere fair with users' perceptions uh, and how they go about their tasks and, and the goals that they wish to achieve. Having, having talked about this, this, this uh, background, we, we, we are going to go into some of these, these topics. Uh, naturally, given the time constraints of the webinar, we are not going to cover everything in depth, but uh, there is much more detail available uh, in, the, in the document on the Cyborg, Cyborg website. So we will start with uh, human capabilities and limitations. There are a number of things that we need to consider. One is the notion of uh, alarm fatigue. Uh, this is something that many people have experienced in many different different settings. Uh, often users would click away error messages that that pop up on on their screen because they are an interruption. And and if uh, there are too frequent error messages that make no sense. There is uh, they they interfere with the primary task, so users will be 
more prone to prone to ignoring them but also if we think about other settings uh, for example people who work in uh, security operations centers and are actually uh, looking at um the uh, uh, intrusion information coming in. If there are far too many false alarms, you're constantly responding to those false alarms, and that has a tendency that the real uh, intrusions in that case may be missed, or the users may not be able to spot them, uh, and also uh, uh, they, 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 they may just be completely tired of, of dealing with lots and lots of false alarms, and, and, uh, and as a result may overlook look the real alarms. There are other uh, things that we may must consider with regards to human capabilities and, and limitations. So uh, there are the uh, issues of short-term memory and long-term memory and how uh, we, we recall uh, info, info, information in, 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 um, uh, in, in, in that regard. So, uh, uh, you know, the use of uh, um uh, the when one when we try to memorize an item it needs to go around that kind of short term memory loop a few times before it is transferred into the long term memory that's why it's actually quite hard to sort of force old passwords out and remember remember new ones and there are interesting mechanisms now out there that for example uh, use of one time pins or passwords so uh, 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 they, they, they are an interesting way of actually helping people not having to memorize uh, lots and lots of things. So one, one example of this would be in the UK, many banks, for instance, use um, um, uh, devices where uh, when users want to log into uh, uh, a bank website, they uh, insert their card and then the card actually, the, the card reader generates a code which they can use uh, to uh, enter uh, the website along with some other credentials. And that is an example of a one-time password, which the user does not necessarily need to remember. There are other examples, such as two-factor authentication, but one should also bear in mind that two-factor authentication has its own limitations in the sense that now the workload often of using one, one device as an entry point has shifted to now using two devices, which may require people to copy uh, uh, pin codes from, say, a mobile phone onto a onto a uh, onto a computer screen, uh, or carry a fob and uh, and and so on. So there is a there are studies out there that show the limitations and the challenges, usability challenges that come from also using new techniques like two-factor authentication. There are other mechanisms to help the users. For example, recall passwords or or write better passwords, and these are uh, things like strength meters, uh, uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, password managers. Password managers are an interesting way to uh, uh, reduce the uh, requirement to uh, recall uh, many, many complex passwords. Strength meters, though, they uh, are designed as a means to help users write stronger password, they effectively add extra work in, into the user's task and also become gate, gatekeepers. And again, the usability issues of strength meters have been, have been studied quite extensively uh, over the years. CAPTCHAs are, are another way uh, uh, in which um, uh, uh, often uh, o online, online sites uh, try to authenticate uh, whether a user is actually a human or an uh, automated bot. So CAPTCHA stand for completely automated public Turing test and to tell computers and humans apart. Uh, and there is a lot of work that has investigated the limitations of CAPTCHAs and how they make it very difficult for users to, again, achieve that primary task of logging into the system. We do have to bear in mind that there is a double-edged sword. CAPTCHAs actually uh, can be uh, also used as a way to support users with uh, with uh, with sensory impairments, for ex uh, for example, but again, we should bear in mind that for legitimate users, um, uh, they they do pose an additional uh, uh, task, which takes them away from from the primary primary task at hand. This all leads us into this question of uh, uh, productivity versus versus security, uh, because as um, users people are trying to achieve a particular task, whether at work or at home. And, and if they feel that security is not being very productive, then there may be, uh, uh, that, that, that may provide them reasons to look for ways to, to bypass security so that they can continue to uh, achieve the task that they want to achieve. And one of, one of the key things that we must always ask when we design 
security mechanisms is as to how can we measure the workload associated with the uh, security tasks. Uh, and, and, you know, a simple proxy for this might be time. How long does it take to complete the uh, security task? So when, for example, a new security policy or a security measure uh, is being implemented, then, you know, one must consider as to, um, uh, you know what what is the time taken to actually accomplish that task and how how long will it take uh, and would it disrupt the primary activity uh, significantly at least uh, if it disrupts the primary activity uh, significantly uh, the other thing that we may also want to consider is as to actually how many steps does it take this is a sort of an uh, further further elaboration of that uh, time taken to complete the task if for example it, it takes multiple steps and quite a long time to to achieve the task and let's assume that people who work in a shared office have to uh, go away whenever they go from the, from their desk they have to uh, uh, lock their lock their screen and every time they come back they have to use two factor authentication to to actually log back into the screen that is constantly adding time to to the work that they are doing on a daily da a daily basis and that can be quite quite disruptive so uh, it's it's very important when we design uh, uh, security measures from a human factors perspective that we should consider that uh, the the uh, amount of time uh, that would be required to achieve a security task and and what is its impact on on productivity of of the user This also leads us into an important discussion, and that is of of uh, compliance fatigue, uh, because uh, the the more uh, we we require of users in terms of effort and resource in uh, in uh, complying with particular security policies, the more overwhelmed the users may may, may um, are likely likely to feel and fatigued by the whole process of of. Of doing doing security, security is of course very important in our modern connected connected uh, infrastructures and society. And of course, it's inevitable that in order to do security, there has to be some effort that that would be required on part of the users. And earlier we talked about uh, security cultures and the importance of security importance of security cultures in in this regard. But uh, again, the more the more effort we add onto the onto the user in terms of compliance with uh, particular uh, security policies and security mechanisms uh, the 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 more likely that they they will suffer uh, suffer compliance fatigue and and again uh, perhaps more prone to considering ways to just get on with the with the task at hand without security being in the way there are other other uh, things that we we must consider earlier we talked about uh, uh, the uh, the 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 cliche that humans are are the are the are the weakest link and and uh, we we should we should consider uh, uh, why human errors arise in 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 the in the, in the first instance um, and and of course uh, you know uh, uh, errors are, errors are are possible and uh, humans by our very nature we 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 can make mistakes uh, you know or unintentionally get 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 something uh, wrong. Um, here we, we we ought to look at the work that has previously been done in the in the in the safety domain by uh, uh, for example James Reason um, where um, uh, 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 he talked about the notion of uh, uh, latent uh, latent design conditions these are uh, conditions that are beyond the control of an individual user but over a period of time they are built into the design of systems so that at some point the conditions align with each other to create the circumstances where a safety incident occurs and we can uh, this is known in um, wider circles as the swiss cheese model where the holes in the cheese actually align for a particular condition to come to pass and and we can we can have a similar swiss cheese model but from a perspective of security that over time the security policies and security mechanisms that are built into the system they lead to particular conditions whereby uh, the threats uh, come through the different layers of the system leading to an an uh, uh, incident uh, in itself uh, and in that regard we must distinguish between the notion of um, uh, the latent failures that arise from organization and local workplace conditions with regards to security, the kind of things that we are talking about where the design of security systems does not 
fit in with the way the humans wish to achieve their primary task or need to achieve their primary task and lead to issues like compliance fatigue and what James Reason refers to as active failures, which are errors and violations by, by humans. With, with regards to uh, uh, that, we also need to bear in mind that errors are part of part of a daily life, and if the errors are not malicious, then we also need to have mechanisms, uh, w- what are called just cultures, where the errors should be should be reported without uh, the risk of of uh, repercussions o- on the user, because that's the only way one can actually create more positive security uh, cultures within uh, within organizations. So when we uh, 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 when we when we talk about uh, uh, security uh, and design of security systems from a human from a human factors perspective, we must also consider as to when we are uh, designing these systems, are we creating uh, latent usability failures in 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 the systems? We have talked about security policies quite a, quite a few times, and and as users, we may may have encountered many of these policies in our in our daily lives. Um, uh, whereby uh, they may range from passwords to particular types of access mechanisms or particular types of security markings on documentation and so on. Um, and uh, the World War II military general uh, Douglas MacArthur uh, uh, coined the phrase, never give an order that can't be obeyed. And we should also consider that we should not ever issue a security policy that cannot be followed. So, uh, um, when when employees, for example, uh, uh, encounter security policies that are impossible to follow and are not effective, it just provides a justification for doubting all security policies. It also undermines the credibility of the uh, cybersecurity teams or the chief information security officers who are issuing them, and it seeds uncertainty uh, and and uh, doubt. So. Uh, but we should also ask the question that instead of when security policies are not being followed, instead of you know reprimanding users or or um, uh, um, uh, provide uh, um, um, uh, 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 employing penalties, we should ask the question as to why uh, uh, a policy is not being followed, and this has to be done in a non-confrontational manner. And that's again where we are talking about. Uh, just cultures that I referred to earlier on, and and the question as to why is it because they are just impossible or too onerous to follow, and one can then redesign the uh, the the solutions in 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 a way that fits in with the working practices of of the of the users. When we when we talk about human factors, we of course must talk about. Uh, cybersecurity awareness and education. This is a topic that that is uh, often high on the agenda in in organizations. Uh, there is a, a, a white paper from the Research Institute in Science of Cybersecurity uh, uh, that 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 was um, published uh, um, uh, recently, um, and and this it talks about the um, the behavior change model that is uh, that is required uh, in, in in that regard, uh, and there are one can start at the sort of very bottom uh, and and think about the investment time, budget, and human resources that are required, and also the personal commitment that would be required from from the users in that regard, and the and the bottom three layers that we see providing information about it, sensitizing users towards security and understanding and knowledge is the kind of elements that are actually covered by standards such as ISO 27001. And they do require time, budget, and human resources. So it is not sufficient to simply do an online online training, which is a tick box exercise when you join an organization. We really need to understand how that information is conveyed and how that sensitizes the users towards security, but also does it really improve their understanding and knowledge. And that requires more extensive programs of work, and again, programs that do not constantly pull users away from their primary task. And that sweet spot and that balance is is a, is a big challenge. But then the top four layers in, the, in this figure, which is uh, conviction, which is positive perception and attitude, 
implementation in terms of skills and abilities. So do you actually have the skills to be able to implement some of the things that, that you're being asked to do? So for example, if all um, uh, uh, me, uh, information that goes on removable media has to be, such as USB stick, has to be encrypted, then do you actually have the skills to be able to uh, do that? And are the tools that are provided to you usable in, in that regard, but also acceptance on part of the users and engaging in safe behavior uh, uh, when, when it comes to security is, is really important. And again, uh, 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 I think it's uh, organizational cultures in this regard are, 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 uh, are a key, key factor. But when we talk about uh, awareness raising and education, we also have to think about a number of mechanism going, mechanisms going beyond the, the of, often used model of uh, um, uh, putting uh, uh, people either in uh, through some online training or in a traditional classroom style setting, and those things uh, have uh, may have their place, but there are other uh, things that can be done. Uh, some organizations, of course, use anti-phishing simulations. Uh, these have to be used with caution because if they are not designed with care, then uh, the risk that one runs is that employees may feel uh, tricked by their own organization and it may undermine trust within the organization uh, itself, but also it may uh, undermine trust in the in the tools, for example, email and, and others that they are trying to use. However, uh, uh, research has shown that uh, actually um, uh, if one can one can uh, design um, uh, these simulations with with uh, with with care, then they 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 can lead to some more positive outcomes uh, uh, as well. And uh, the the factors such as uh, you know um, undermining trust, so that employees sort of become reluctant to click on links or not act on genuine emails, uh, have to be considered when you, when when one designs these kind of kind of simulations. A more recent thing that has become uh, uh, quite uh, quite popular and seeing growing interest is the use of of uh, uh, other mechanisms such as uh, security awareness games. Uh, these are not just the capture the flag kind of exercises that are often used in terms of red teaming and blue teaming to uh, understand uh, uh, security vulnerabilities and defenses in a system. There are tabletop games that are that are available on the screen is one example, which is uh, the decisions and disruptions game that is now used by the uh, uh, London Metropolitan Police Service as part of their outreach program to organizations raising awareness at different levels, including including at board levels. And in this case, the game charges the uh, the players uh, as a group to defend an infrastructure that initially has no security in place from uh, from cyber attacks. There are a number of choices that are available to the to the players, and they make investments within limited budgets in each round into those choices. And effectively, the game is a sandpit that allows users to experience security decision making and the implications of the, that decision making, but also that security is under zero sum game, and and that they have to work within particular budget constraints and the potential implications of. Uh, some of their decisions or non-decisions in this regard. For example, does it lead to an increased exposure of the organization? What is the economic consequence of some of the attacks coming to succeed and uh, reputational damage? There are other games such as Control Alt Hack, Docs, and and uh, uh, and, and various uh, others uh, that are also designed for particular uh, particular particular settings or more more general general play settings. Uh, games uh, and particularly these kind of tabletop games provide an interesting way to sensitize users towards security in a fun and easy uh, to relate, relate manner. We should briefly talk about uh, mental models of, of uh, cyber risks and defense. Uh, uh, um, as security experts, one, one, may, one may have a tendency to think that users have a, a full understanding of how systems function and, and, and what are the implications of uh, some of the uh, um, uh, actions that the uh, uh, user uh, user takes. Uh, so, as an example, uh, 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 a user will most likely have a, a task action model 
that allows them to operate a particular uh, computer or software system uh, successfully. Experts, on the other hand, may have very detailed structural models. So a task action model might be that as users, we are all, uh, uh, we learn to drive cars and we can drive a car, but experts who have understanding of the engineering and structural models can diagnose faults and, and uh, repair them. So we, we cannot expect non-security experts to have a full understanding of the system. So again, when we are designing security mechanisms, we have to, uh, to consider these. And there is a, a growing body of work on understanding users as mental models of, of uh, cybersecurity and risk. And, and how these impact in in uh, in terms of some of the actions that users take, but also how they le often also lead to struggles with the kind of security mechanisms that are provided to to the users. Positive security is a really important element of of uh, human factors. Uh, we should ask the um, uh, question as to what is what is the goal of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is at the moment, uh, of course, in the news. It's a fundamental uh, uh, challenge that faces the society, especially as we build more and more connected systems and infrastructures such as smart cities and intelligent transportation. But all the uh, uh, narrative around cybersecurity often tends to be uh, tends to be very negative. If if we uh, ask uh, um, uh, 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 users, uh, you know, or, or most people, uh, what is the goal of cybersecurity? This the, the narrative is always about preventing attacks and 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 uh, 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 and exploitation of vulnerabilities, uh, and and that is often also used by uh, vendors and those who want to take or uh, want organizations to take security more seriously to resort to what is called a uh, fud sale, fear, uncertainty, and doubt creating fears of attacks and their consequences, uncertainty about the consequences, and doubt about the organization's ability to, to defend themselves. Uh, and um, uh, and I think the uh, uh, challenge there comes from the fact uh, that these FUD sales are not a good basis for security decision making. There needs to be a more positive uh, approach towards security. Why security makes a difference uh, to 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 the uh, to the uh, to the work that we do. So, for example, uh, we we security should be something that allows us to engage in the activities that we value without uh, uh, consequences in terms of harm from loss of data uh, and 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 so on and experiences that we we cherish. And security should be a positive differentiator in terms of being able to achieve the task or to use the products. Uh, with with uh, confidence and and trust, and we need to uh, cha change that uh, uh, change that perspective, moving away from uh, um, uh, 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 fear, uh, uncertainty, and uh, doubt sale uh, to a more more positive attitude and a more 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 uh, more positive narrative around security, and that also applies to the. Uh, the the notion of uh, calling people a weakest link um, uh, because it, 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 it demonizes uh, people and blames them for not being able to make sense of or comply with security. Uh, I'm going to finish with uh, talking about one other uh, uh, type of uh, of um, uh, stakeholders in a human factors setting. We've talked a lot about end users. Uh, and organizations uh, also want to talk a, a little bit about developers. Of course, software sits at the heart of and the very fabric of the society that we, we inhabit, all the way from the transportation infrastructures that we use to uh, the applications that we use on our computers and, and uh, uh, mobile devices, um, uh, through to our uh, uh, financial transactions and, and daily interactions with, with, with friends and, and uh, uh, um, uh, colleagues in online social media. All this software is, of course, uh, developed by humans too. Uh, and that's something that we must must bear in mind. And in a similar fashion to how end users face usability issues with security, software developers also need more usable tools to be able to achieve uh, uh, the task of writing more more secure uh, secure software, because that overall will then improve the quality of the software and reduce the vulnerabilities that we encounter. So there are a number of usability 
issues that developers face in their uh, in their in their daily lives uh, when when they when they work with, for example, uh, uh, security uh, and cryptography uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, often referred to as application programming interfaces, when you are trying to incorporate particular functionality into your uh, into your system. Uh, there is a recent study that categorizes some of the issues that developers face on the basis of the kind of questions that they ask from uh, uh, users in uh, from other developers on uh, websites like Stack Overflow. Uh, and there are a number of issues from developers not knowing whether they should use a particular feature in a cryptographic library or how should they go about using a particular feature in a in a cryptographic library. There are issues such as missing documentation, lack of availability of example code in those those libraries, or uh, clarity of documentation, uh, but also compatibility issue with the other systems that they are they are using, or often uh, developers thinking uh, being experts in using a, a particular cryptographic library and then trying to apply that mental model to a different cryptographic library which doesn't fit that. Uh, mental model um, and all these and uh, the, 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 this recent study and some of the other studies show us that uh, developers do face face usability issues and we need to come up with a more improved ways of making the security APIs usable to them. This is captured very well as a synthesis by uh, uh, Matthew Green and Matthew Smith in a in a in a paper about three years ago where they effectively uh, 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 took the um, uh, title of the original uh, Ann Adams and Angela Sasa paper on um, uh, users are not the enemy, uh, to talk about developers are not the enemy and the need for usable security APIs. Uh, uh, they posit uh, 10 principles for the usability of crypto APIs uh, that, that, that would help improve uh, uh, their, their usability for developers. Uh, these uh, go from, for example, abstraction, where the uh, cryptographic functionality should not be separate to the standard APIs that developers are using so that they don't have to uh, interact with something new. This is, again, taking people away from the primary task. They have to be powerful. So one of the big challenges at the moment is that cryptographic APIs have to cater for a lot of different uh, users. So often uh, the parameters and the settings that developers have to set can be very complicated. So they have to be powerful to serve both security and non-security requirements uh, uh, so um, so that they, they, they do not, again, um, interfere with, 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 with that core task. They have to be comprehensible, easy to learn, even if you don't have cryptographic expertise. Not all developers are, actually the majority of them won't be expert cryptographers. And they have to be ergonomic. So again, developers have particular ways of working. They may be thinking in terms of particular abstraction and the kind of languages and programming paradigms they're using. So they shouldn't break the developer's paradigm and they should be intuitive. They should be easy to use even without documentation. So as I was saying earlier, uh, often they have very complicated settings and we, we have to make sure that they are more intuitive and developers don't don't have to um, uh, either uh, have uh, ask lots of questions or go through very complicated settings to make them to work. Uh, they should also be hard to misuse, misuse. so uh, uh, incorrect use should lead to some visible errors. The default should be safe and never ambiguous. They should be testable, so uh, people should be able to te test them uh, and, and uh, uh, check uh, uh, that the, the security that they want to achieve can be achieved. They should be easy to read, of course, and, and hence make it possible to update applications more easily when they are updated and explain. They should assist as to uh, with you know usable uh, error messages as to when things go wrong, but also you know provide those error messages in an interpretable way so that when things do go wrong at runtime in an application, then a user can understand as to what is happening. Uh, very, very briefly, this this work was taken up by by uh, the recent paper that I, I I was referring to earlier to analyze whether uh, a number of existing uh, cryptographic libraries uh, do uh, do uh, follow some of these usability principles in the light of the struggles that that developers uh, have. Um, uh, we can here go to the notion of a code smell, which is a well-known concept in software refactoring uh, uh, by Martin Fowler. So this is an example here of uh, Fowler's shotgun surgery, code smell, 
uh, where he talks about the fact that you whiff this every time you make a kind of change in your software. Uh, if you need to make a lot of little different changes, then that means that your code is not very well modularized uh, and it's all over the place and you may want to modularize it in one place so that the cost of making the change is not so high. And in a similar fashion, we can identify different types of usability smells on the basis of the struggles that developers have and uh, relating those struggles to the Green and Smith principles. Uh, and there, 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 there are four example smells here. One is that it needs a super sleuth, which is when documentation is missing, unclear, or there is a lack of example code pertaining to how to use the library. Then the developers really have to investigate how to use something. The confusion reigns. So for example, when developers are designing and prototyping their programs, uh, they, they may find it hard to decide whether it is the right library to use or how best to start using it. Uh, uh, the third is needing a postmortem. So the developer may have used the library, but something has gone wrong. Uh, and either they have used the library incorrectly or they are struggling to work out if it is an issue with the library itself. And finally, the fourth one doesn't play well with others uh, when the library just won't build or won't integrate with other libraries and build systems or has uh, for example, uh, performance or or other 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 penalties for uh, incorporating it, and uh, not not very clear explanations as to why. And these are these are some initial uh, usability smells that we, we may see when particular usability principles are not being followed. But there, of course, there may well be others. So we we started with this figure where we uh, talked about the. Um, uh, the human behaviors, but also the wider context that needs to be considered when we talk about about uh, 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 human factors with regards to uh, cybersecurity. The key thing that we uh, must uh, must remember is that humans and technologies do not exist in isolation. Humans, we humans, conceive new technologies. We design and implement them. We talked about developers, and we are also their users. Uh, and 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 maintainers in that regard. And cybersecurity is no different. Human behaviors shape cybersecurity. So for example, our responses to phishing campaigns may lead to anti-phishing filters or new security training. Equally, the design of cybersecurity, humans design those filters or training mechanisms, impacts people's interactions with systems and the security mechanisms designed to those, those, uh, those systems. So we must consider this relationship between this intricate relationship between humans and technologies and, and security throughout the conception, design, implementation, maintenance, and evolution. And let's also not forget the commissioning of cybersecurity mechanisms because a lot of data sits in these systems and we often do not think enough about what happens when systems are decommissioned and how that data is either reclaimed or, or safely, safely destroyed. Um, and, and human factors, therefore, must play a very central role in uh, cybersecurity as, as, as a question and as, 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 as something that we, we address uh, as both a research and practice community and society at large, because after all, the purpose of uh, cybersecurity is to protect people, their data, information, and, and, and safety. So we must remember when we talk about uh, human factors that we must, as far as possible, fit the task to the human and not the human to the task. Um, uh, I, I hope that uh, you, you will enjoy reading the cybersecurity uh, uh, knowledge area and this webinar uh, helpful in understanding more about human factors in cybersecurity. Thank you.